got a DUI the the night after my husband came home from uh, Arkansas when his mother died, and um, that was my first DUI. The the law enforcement tended to look the other way when the military were misbehaving. I deserved a DUI long before that, but I got to spend the night in jail, and a judge sent me to AA, and I thought it was a cult. So. It took me, so that was 1986, and it took me until 2018. It's all good. Francesca Bottastelli has a song about perfection is my enemy. I got a couple dents in my fender. I got a couple rips in my jeans. Mm. So, uh, yeah, it ain't about perfect. What is your name? Cindy Sexton. Thanks, Cindy, for doing this. So the first question I have for you is, what is addiction? Oh, uh, addiction is um, described as cunning, baffling, powerful, and it's a coping mechanism to help me get through difficult things in life. All right, so let's get into your story. Okay. Uh, I was an only child. It was eight years before I was born. My mom had lots of miscarriages. Uh, so uh, I noticed my mom was r rageful and actually suicidal. And one day I was about 12 years old and I, I asked her point blank, what, what's up? Why are you this way? And she told me that because it was so long after their marriage that I was born, my dad was jealous of me and cheated on her. And I didn't realize it at the time, but in essence, what that meant was my birth was the reason for her misery. And so I carried that over my shoulder on my back for decades until one day I saw a picture of my dad holding me as a little tiny baby and uh, the look on his face, I could almost audibly hear that was a lie. And I carried it for a long time. And, and what further, what I heard was mom was the one that was jealous you know, because she had a hard childhood abuse, you know, physical, sexual abuse. And I think she was jealous. I think it was just having that, chaotic you know fights and suicide attempts and all that stuff and and not knowing where to take it what to do with it no no siblings to talk to didn't talk about that kind of stuff outside the house and so i got this hyper vigilance about me at a young age and you know beg my parents don't fight and they would tell me this doesn't concern you and fitting in i mean i was a fat kid too so yeah, using was a way to escape the fear and the pain of what I was living with. And it was around that time, not too long after that, that I started to use. Food was way before any substances, you might say. <clears throat> so food was my first addiction and then not too long after that you know i found cigarettes and alcohol and tried every single substance i could get my hands on to change the way i felt to feel better and that continued and it continued through a military service for six years um by the grace of god i stopped using long enough to give birth to two really awesome children it took me until 2018. There was drizzling rain that day. I just put my car in drive and headed home. At the top of my street that day, um, there was a lady waiting to turn out and I was turning in and I ran into her and it was just totally mindlessness that was at the bottom of that, I think. And she had a four month old child in the back seat. As soon as I had that wreck, and it's drizzling rain out, and I look up and I go, really, God? Is that what you wanted to say? And so I wrestled for a while 
with, you know, because my kid had been after me about about narcotics and and because you know pot had just became legal and so I was doing both and and I always medicated before yoga because it helped me helped me move better. I heard my higher power saying, you know, you need to really look at this. I was like three houses away from being home about a month later when I heard a thump under my wheel of my car. And the next thing I heard was a scream from over here. And this family was out getting groceries out of their car and their little bitty dog ended up being run over and killed by me. Looking back, I thought if that had been a child, I had a couple of bottles of pills at home that I hadn't even opened yet. I don't think I could have lived with running over and killing a child. That would have been the lowest of low. And I probably would have went home and just, you know, took care of business and ended it. I need help. And I tried religion, psychiatry, medication, tried all that. And none of that was working. And so I gave 12 Step a chance. And best decision I ever made. It took me a long time to get grateful, really long time. And gratitude is at the heart of getting a life worth living, is to look around and see what I have to be grateful for. And there was a lot. My sponsor gave me an assignment for 100 character defects to define those, to say how I act out on those, and then to make a list of antonyms for those character defects. And what I have seen unfold is those antonyms are a roadmap for me. They're a roadmap for me for how I want to be, for how I want to live, for what my values, what my core values really are, and that it's okay to, to let them shine let them come out. I had one relapse and it was on Mother's Day a year after my February clean date. Interesting situation there. My kid, my kids met me at the beach and my oldest is a daily pot smoker. No, no blame, no judgment there, but she didn't want to go outside the car and, and smoke. So I told her, that's fine. They're in the back seat. My dogs are in the front seat with me. Go ahead. I don't care. And then she sets it down right next to me. So I had to change my clean date, and that's okay. I didn't stay out. I went right back to my home group and and owned what what had happened. I don't count that little relapse as losing everything I had because I still had what I had gotten so far. I belong to a lot of different groups. I've learned so much, and I've formed relationships with some of the most amazing human beings I've ever met. Um, I have a psychologist that teaches me acceptance and commitment therapy, and that has gone a long way to relieve the pain that I was medicating for nine years with those narcotics. Life happens for me, not to me. And that does not always, sometimes I want to say, F you, life. But when I can take a step back and look at things, um, I can see where sometimes those horrific things that happen, they're actually for me. If I can just adjust my view a little bit. One of my favorite words that I've stumbled upon is equanimity and its composure even in the face of chaos and an offshoot word of equanimity is equanimous when all around you is crumbling and falling apart it's what I carry on the inside that makes me okay it makes me know I'm safe 
I'm not in danger. I'm not under threat anymore like I was when I was a little kid. The boogeyman's not coming for me. And furthermore, no one else is coming to rescue me. I'm the one that gets to tell the parts on the inside. I'm here for you. I'm here with you. And you're okay. It's okay. And that has been a big gift for me to be able to say that to myself and, and know that it's true. If you had one tip, what would it be? Just take the first step. Don't look at the whole staircase. And if you fall down, back up again. I mean, every city all across the world has 12-step meetings, and you can find those really easily, um, and that's a good jumping-off place. So just do something. Do anything. Reach out. Don't let your fear, your pride, whatever. Because at some point, the pain becomes greater than the fear. The pain of addiction, the pain of whatever you're going through becomes greater than the fear and then you're ready to move and just reach out. If you encounter roadblocks, don't give up. Be your own hero. Be your own, you know, champion because, uh, you know, I got help through my health care provider who first told me I wasn't messed up enough to get help from them. I had to be a danger to myself or others. Don't buy that. Keep, keep being your own advocate. Oh, and br breathe. Don't forget to breathe. That's an important one. What is sobriety? Sobriety is being truly present in my life. Sobriety is feeling my feelings and not trying to cover them up. Because when I'm trying to shove away the pain and the ugly and the hurt and all that, I'm missing the joy. And I can't be selective when I'm when I'm shoving the bad away I don't get the good either so that is sobriety I'm fully engaged with everything I'm not destroyed by the bad but I you know I got this life beyond my wildest dreams yeah may I be happy May I be healthy, mind and body. May I feel safe and loved. And may I be free of unnecessary suffering. And I think that right there is, uh, that says it all for me. Hi. I'm Kenny Hill with Recovery Hill. My intention here is to show the diversity of sobriety. How one finds themselves clawing from bottom is as nuanced as their journey to bottom. And their situation and recovery has the potential to be highly relatable to somebody who is watching. Therefore, I offer the interviewees to have total freedom to express whatever has worked for them whatever has helped them sustain sobriety. That said, here at the end of the interview, I wanna make a quick request so that it wasn't to take away from the interview itself. This request is that you like and share the video. You can subscribe if you want, that's up to you, but at least like and share it so that the content can get to as many people as possible. There is a great capacity and potential for the story you just watched to be able to help out somebody else to begin their story 
of recovery.